I would also, um, as Noel did, like to thank our various co-hosting organizations, uh, ASA, ASBO, COSIN, DQC, and NASSP. Really thrilled uh, to have all of our organizations um, joining together to provide this information to all of you. So we're gonna dig just a little bit into Student Privacy 101. So first of all, what are we talking about? And then what are some of the existing laws um, that we're dealing with as we look at student privacy issues? So let's do some definitions first. Uh, so privacy is a pretty amorphous concept. Uh, people in different contexts define privacy in various ways. So one person could think of privacy as being alone in a private space, such as their bedroom. Another person may associate privacy with being free from surveillance, whether uh, by their parents, their schools, the government, or companies. Uh, some of the most common conceptions of data privacy include the fact that data privacy is considered a fundamental right uh, recognized in the US Constitution, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and in over 80 countries around the world, as, so, as well as uh, several state constitutions. Privacy rights also provide the foundation for other important rights, including self-determination and free expression. Another aspect is how a person can control their personal information, um, how they can control how it is shared, how it is collected, and how it is used. A person's ability to explore without, um, sorry, uh, data privacy is also subjective. Each person has unique privacy preferences and expectations. What feels invasive or creepy to one person may be innovative and exciting to another. Um, a lot of factors influence these preferences and expectations, including a person's familiarity with the entity or person collecting their data, whether that person is from a marginalized community whose data may have been used in inequitable ways, that person's cultural background, and their trust in the organization collecting, using, or sharing their data. Finally, data privacy is contextual. Whether it is appropriate to use or share personal data in whatever manner depends on ever-evolving social and ethical norms and legal frameworks. So in order to ensure that people understand how the school or that school's community norms I uh, think, of, think about privacy, it is essential for schools, for any educational agencies or institutions to communicate and engage directly with members of their community. And sometimes privacy is a little broader than people might think. Uh, more and more, privacy is being construed as something about power and the laws that protect us that deal with privacy often seek to mitigate the inherent power balance imbalances between people and those that collect, process, and profit off of their data, uh, as put by a former um, uh, Mozilla fellow, uh, Friedrich Kalthuner. Um, since the introduction of a lot of different technologies and the growth of the ability to collect and use data at scales never seen before, uh, stakeholders talk about privacy in terms of fairness and power. The more information that one person or organization has about another person, the more that that person can influence or exert power over someone else. So when we're talking about student data privacy, we are talking about the responsible, ethical, and equitable collection, use, sharing, and protection of student data. So we've defined student privacy. What are the risks that we're looking at that we're trying to mitigate through laws, through best practices, uh, through our everyday interactions in a school setting? 
So there are often concerns about companies accessing or using student data to target students with advertisements or to build student profiles. There are equity concerns. Students have varying access to devices or internet services, which has implications for safeguards that are going to be put in place and the monitoring that occurs of that student's activities. There can be social harms. So the revelation of personal or sensitive student information can result in stigmatization and in bullying. Over surveillance is another risk. When you have over collection and monitoring of student data and online activity, that can have chilling effects on student ability to learn, to engage in honesty with their classmates and with their teacher, and to become the person that we hope that all children are able to become fully functioning, engaged members of society. There's also a risk of a permanent record. Records of events, specifically mistakes, could be retained indefinitely just due to the fact that storage is cheap and sorting through data is very time and labor intensive. This could potentially lead to detailed profiles that could negatively impact impact students' future opportunities, despite the fact that the information may no longer be relevant to that student. You may also see a loss of opportunity as a concern. So when student data is used to make decisions about students, uh, it can be used to both provide opportunities, but also potentially to take away opportunities. There's also risks when it comes to age and appropriate content and, of course, to the physical or emotional safety uh, of students when personal or otherwise sensitive information is revealed. And these risks are often not apparent, so they can be incremental. Uh, so as more and more data is collected, privacy risks uh, increase. Uh, they can be unequal. Uh, so privacy risk may accrue unevenly throughout society, with some community members reaping the benefits of data-driven governance, while others bear the burden of some of the privacy risks that I just discussed. Most recently, we saw this with some schools requiring students to have video cameras on during virtual classes, which can be particularly hard for students experiencing homelessness, experiencing an eviction, multitasking due to caretaker duties or those with internet connectivity issues. Privacy risks can be not obvious. So certain privacy risks are more impactful or more likely to occur for particular groups. And technology designers um, who have not incorporated those groups input may overlook those risks. Finally, privacy risks can feel creepy, can feel intrusive. Privacy is closely tied to feelings about self-control and autonomy. And so the real or perceived loss of privacy can leave people feeling vulnerable, exposed, and out of control of their own lives, which can have a chilling effect on individuals and communities' behavior, can harm relationships, and cause a loss of trust. So now that we've defined privacy and talked about some of the risks that we're dealing with, let's talk about some of the laws that are in place to try to manage those risks. So I always love to start a conversation about FERPA with this quote. Uh, so uh, for those of you who are just listening and not watching today, uh, this says computerized record keeping systems by several school districts may make detection of errors somewhat more difficult unless extreme care is taken by school personnel. The more frequently that records are examined, the more likely it is that mistakes will be discovered and corrected. The eventual widespread use of computers in schools, therefore, should be accompanied by policies encouraging more frequent access to school records by parents as well as school personnel. This isn't a quote from 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. This is a quote from the 1969 Russell Sage Foundation survey on school record keeping, a report that directly influenced the passage of the primary federal student privacy law, FERPA. FERPA was passed in 1974 
uh, its full name is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And it had two main goals. First of all, ensuring that parents and students were provided access to their or their child's educational records. And then privacy, preventing unauthorized disclosure of educational records without consent, or if data was disclosed without consent, requiring very specific safeguards. The main provisions of FERPA grant parents and eligible students, usually those over 18, the following rights. So a right to an annual notification of the school's FERPA policy, which includes a whole bunch of information, um, the right of access to their child's or their own education records, the right to seek amendment or correction of their child's or their education records, the right to confidentiality of the personally identifiable information in their child's or their own education records, and a right to file a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education for alleged violations. As mentioned, most of the time, uh, students and parents um, will have to consent before data is shared. But in order for schools to function, there are specific exceptions to consent. But as I said, safeguards surround those exceptions. You have uh, just some of the exceptions listed here, certainly not the full list. Uh, directory information, which is literally the ability to have school directory, where you have, you know, maybe parent information, student emails, the ability to list which students are part of the school play or in the school band and the uh, handout you get at the beginning of the concert, uh, the ability for to share email addresses between students for group projects, uh, to have a yearbook. Directory information, once it is disclosed, uh, doesn't have a limit on its sharing um, because, as I mentioned, when you hand somebody the program for the band concert, uh, you're not collecting those back at the end of the concert. There's no real way to limit that. And therefore, directory information is an exception that allows parents and students to opt out. You can require that your school not disclose any directory information about you to any other party. The other exceptions don't have that ability to opt out. You have the school official exception, which is when information is being shared with, say, teachers or with uh, the parent volunteer, with uh, from a teacher to a school counselor. Uh, when you share data with uh, the company that texts all the parents about whether it's a snow day, when you share it uh, with the email provider for students or to sign up with a math app. But there are very specific requirements. So you have to make sure that the school is in direct control of any information shared under this exception. And there are a variety of other safeguards included before information can be shared under this exception. and information cannot be shared after the information is shared with that party. So if a company receives student information under this exception, they not only have to have certain safeguards in their contract or work with the school, they also cannot share that information um, for other purposes without the school's permission or without parent and student permission. You have several other exceptions as mentioned, the health and safety exception, which is for emergencies. Uh, so, you know, if there's a tornado and a classroom collapses, uh, you could share the list of all the students who were in that classroom. Um, you also have studies and audit and evaluation exceptions, which allows for research and evidence-based policymaking, um, but you must have a written agreement before any data is shared and certain protections must be described in that written agreement. And then you have law enforcement access um, through various of these exceptions. So school resource officers may receive information partially under the school official exception. Uh, you have um, access via subpoena. Um, that you know could be challenged by the school and you 
um, have to disclose to the parent or student before information is turned over to law enforcement. Uh, you could have um, other sharing, again, under that emergency exception. But generally speaking, whenever a parent or student is not consenting to information being shared, there are strong limitations. Not that they're always clear, but there are strong limitations on how information uh, can be used and whether it can be shared beyond that. I'd like to direct all of you to studentprivacy.ed.gov. The Department of Ed describes FERPA uh, much better than I can in several videos and informational uh, materials. They've done an amazing job providing resources, and I highly recommend you check out their resources if you want to know more about FERPA. I'm going to briefly cover a couple of the other laws here. So you have COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. This law applies to operators of commercial websites or online services, so generally companies. And it applies when the app is either directed to children and collects personal information from children under 13, or when a company has actual knowledge that they collect personal information from children under 13. This law is generally enforced by the Federal Trade Commission, um, but has also been enforced by state attorneys general. The penalty for non-compliance is high. Civil penalties up to $41,484 per violation per child per day. Um, covered operators must provide a privacy policy, obtain verifiable parental consent before collecting personal information from children under 13, provide parents with access and deletion rights to their child's personal information, and give parents the opportunity to withdraw consent. But how does COPPA apply in schools? COPPA does, first and foremost, apply in schools, to be very clear. So when a school has contracted with an operator to collect personal information from students solely, solely for the benefit of students in the school for an educational purpose, the school can provide consent under COPPA instead of the parent providing consent. But again, this is only, only for an educational purpose. If there is any other, you know, something in that uh, app or in, on that website that has any commercial purpose. So if there is tracking of that student, um, if there are targeted ads, if there's an ability to, you know, buy the next game, it's likely that the school cannot consent and that the parent must instead provide their consent. The operator must provide the school with COPPA required notices and rights and cannot state that a school is responsible for complying with COPPA. The burden is on the operator at the company, not on the school. However, schools sh should generally understand how the operator will collect, use, and disclose personal information. Consider providing parents with a notice of what websites and online services uh, uh, they are using under COPPA. Ensure operators delete children's personal information, which once no longer needed, which is also a requirement on any of the operators. And consider the layered additional obligations that they may have not only under COPPA, but also FERPA, uh, PPRA, which I'm about to talk about, and state laws. Our next federal law for the day is the Protection of People Rights Amendment, uh, coming right after FERPA uh, in uh, the statute. PPRA is a law that's aimed at giving parents uh, more authority um, and the ability to opt in or opt out when certain sensitive questions are being asked in a survey um, or really in most places in a school. So when you have a survey that asks about political affiliations, mental or psychological problems, sex behavior and attitudes, illegal, antisocial, self-incriminating or demeaning behavior, critical appraisals of other individuals, uh, so criticism of someone's family, uh, legally recognized privileged or analogous relationships or religion, 
you generally have to get parental consent or provide parents the right to opt out before that survey can be provided. There's a bunch of other various things that PPRA also uh, includes as protections, but I won't go into them today um, due to our lack of time. But again, would point you to the US Department of Ed uh, and also a blog um, that FPF has pulled together on PPRA, which we'll send around after today's event. Let's talk about even more loss. <laughs> so, it's been pretty busy over the past seven, eight years in student privacy world. Well over a thousand student privacy bills have been introduced in all 50 states since 2013. And of those, 43 states have passed more than 130 laws since 2013. This is an incredibly regulated area and also a messy one that isn't always clear to everyone. Uh, so if you're interested in whether your state has a law, um, we do have a list of all those laws that have passed since 2013 on our website, Student Privacy Compass. So there are two types of laws, speaking very generally, laws that are based on FERPA and laws that are based on SOPIPA, which we'll hear about in our second panel. Laws based on FERPA are aimed at local and state education agencies. So your school, your district, or your Department of Education has certain requirements that are added on to the obligations they already have under FERPA. So this might be transparency requirements like posting all of the apps that are being used to school websites. This could be uh, data governance requirements like uh, creating a data governance manual and posting it publicly. It might give additional rights to parents or others uh, beyond those that are provided by FERPA, or it may have some prohibited uh, uses or types of data that can be collected. So some states restrict, for example, uh, the collection of certain biometric data or limit, uh, do not allow any data to be disclosed to someone who will use that information uh, for a commercial purpose. The other type of law based on SIPIPA, that is a law um, first passed in California, now in well over 30 states. And these laws directly regulate vendors. So it requires that vendors um, in addition to you know, the requirements under FERPA, not target advertisements, not sell student data or use student data for non-educational purpose, requires that they delete data when the school tells them to, requires that they maybe have certain security requirements, requires uh, that they perhaps have certain transparency requirements that they need to meet. So the 130 plus laws that we have sort of vary in details, but generally they'll fall into one of these two buckets. But let's talk about the mess that happens when you have that many laws and regulations uh, and new policies coming up. So we saw a lot of unintended consequences uh, when these laws were being passed. Uh, so you had Louisiana pass an extremely restrictive law that would send you to jail if you made a mistake as an educator, um, and that got rolled back uh, the following year. Um, you had um, some concern with other laws where certain data um, reporting was not able to happen, so you weren't able to report on uh, high school graduation rates or do some of the required reporting on equity um, that helps uh, that helps identify when students are being disproportionately punished um, if they're from marginalized communities. Um, you had other states that couldn't provide uh, classroom recording for students with disabilities or others um, who needed it as part of their individualized education plan. Um, and we've seen you know, a lot of states that lacked, passed a privacy law, but then lacked uh, the levers to get um, some of the companies in this space uh, to 
add those additional privacy protections. Most recently, we have seen some unintended consequences from some of the consumer privacy laws that have come up. So uh, the ability of consumers to delete uh, uh, data about that person uh, can be abused, unfortunately, when it comes to schools. So deleting someone's attendance record, for example, is something um, that we've seen concern about, fortunately, uh, many of the state regulators have thought about this and built in some exceptions there. You also have unintended consequences on the other side. So laws that harm student privacy or may go too far. So many states uh, passing laws that require statewide social media monitoring, uh, require cameras um, in the classroom uh, for you know, checking on abuse with audio, um, requiring schools to inquire about student mental health status. Um, and there aren't necessarily privacy safeguards built into these laws um, that would find the right balance between making sure that data and tech can be used to help students while protecting their privacy and having sufficient privacy guardrails around those uses. You also have a ton of other legal levers that I don't have time to talk about today. So IDEA has privacy requirements. The Federal Trade Commission not only runs COPPA, they also have authority um, under Section 5 uh, to go out after um, companies with unfair or deceptive practices. Higher ed institutions are subject to GLBA, which is banking privacy, um, and many other security requirements if they receive federal grants. Uh, you occasionally have HIPAA coming in here, though that's fairly rare since HIPAA expressly has an exception for any data covered by FERPA. You have various judicial remedies that can come up via common law or the Fourth Amendment, uh, tort law. You have state attorneys general who can um, enforce some of those state student privacy laws I just talked about. And then you have the power of the question, which as my old boss used to say, is invaluable. So policymakers stepping up or other individuals stepping up uh, in op-eds, through letters, et cetera, to say what is happening in student privacy in your district, in your company, uh, in the field in general, to make a difference and to push people to continue to improve privacy practices. Our last goal, our most important goal is not only having legal protections, it is about cultivating a culture of privacy. If you pass a law, but that law is not implemented properly, then what's the point of the law? How do you make sure that districts, that higher ed institutions, that everyone has the resources necessary and the training given to ensure that everyone who has access to students' personal information is trained and knows why and how to effectively and ethically collect, use, share, protect, and secure it. As Noel mentioned, uh, we are co-chairs of the Federal Education Privacy Coalition. Um, we'll be sending out all of these slides after this. Um, and there are a number of resources developed by my organization, our website, studentprivacycompass.org, uh, with everything from training for teachers to the policymakers guide to student data privacy and very concrete in the weeds FAQs for school administrators dealing with health questions around student privacy during the pandemic. We're going to send around all of these slides. I have several slides with links to resources on various issues. So stay tuned and please feel free to reach out with any questions you might have now or after.